so good to see everybody here. Um, this is really a special time. You know, it's, it, it's, it's Black History Month, and of course, we're also celebrating our 100th anniversary of being named Arlington. Um, and we decided, as we were celebrating this year, to do it all the way throughout the year. And we wanted to make sure that we're studying history and thinking what happened in the past, but using that to look forward. So we've got a very special panel here today and tonight, and we've got Joan Mulholland, who I think is going to come and join us, Portia Clark, who is coming from the train station and hopes to join us soon. Um, yeah. And, the, uh, and we've got a slideshow here going from our Center for Local History, which is just running a slideshow in the back with fascinating pictures. Um, I am joined by my colleague, Christian Dorsey, who is here. Christian, I don't know if any of my other colleagues, Christian's going to help moderate tonight. I'm just kind of getting this set up here. So we've got three questions for the panelists that they're sort of ready to talk about, and I think I'll let Christian Dorsey kind of introduce that as he does the moderating. But I think I'd like to introduce our panelists. We've got Dr. Alfred Taylor who is here, former. <laughs> you know, so I'm giving y'all introductions, but you don't need any introductions with this audience, right? I think there are a few people here, though, who are doing some studying from George Mason, or, and so I'll, I'll do the introduction formal thing. I, everybody, everybody knows Dr. Taylor, former president of the Arlington branch of the NAACP, 2019 recipient of the William T. Newman uh, Jr. Spirit of Community Award, local historian, he's written a book, and done many, many things, which I hope you will tell, talk to us about, because he's experienced a lot here in Arlington. Kitty Clark Stevenson, president of Ablen Consulting, <clears throat> assistant registrar for the Arlington, Virginia Electoral Board. <laughs> and what, which commission was it you chaired all those years? Human rights. Yes, human rights. She has some other talents, but she said it was her deep secret, so I'm not going to talk about it. You want you? OK, I won't. See me afterwards. Joan Mulholland, and Joan is right here. Joan was out, civil rights activist, founder of the Joan Trump Power Mulholland Foundation. My no. Son is the uh -huh. Tell me what he was up to. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if he's your son. Well, we, we, thank you. Mother of the founder. <laughs> All right. And then we've got, uh, unfortunately, Frank Wilson was going to be with us tonight, but I just talked to Frank. He, he, he is getting better. He is on the mend, but he is not feeling well enough to come tonight, so he will not be with us. And we've got Barbara Harrison, Baskerville, Arlington resident, neighbor of, of Ms. Ham, right? Yeah. <laughs> Lots of stories to tell, which we're looking forward to hear. And Portia Clark, as I say, president of the Green Valley Civic Association and longtime activist here in Arlington, is on her way. So I think... Christian, would you like to come and introduce the, the questions a little bit, and we'll get everybody started talking, and I'm just going to take a seat and enjoy the show, if that's okay. Terrific. All right, great. Thank you all. all right. Well, thank you very much, Libby, for, uh, for starting us off tonight and really for inspiring tonight's event, and thank you to the panelists for all being available on this evening as Arlington commemorates uh, Black History Month. I'd also like to extend... A, uh, a thank you to all of you who are in attendance. We realize that during this time of year, there are lots of different community events that are worthwhile that you could be participating in in Arlington and that you chose to be here tonight means the world to us. And I should also me mention uh, here in the audience, we have a uh, former county manager, Barbara Dinellen, uh, who, who this auditorium is named after, by the way. <laughs> It's like, how often are you in a place and the person that it's named after is actually there as well? And our former colleague on the county board, John Vistad, is here. Thank you all so very much for being here. So, you know, tonight is really all about understanding Arlington's racial history and understanding what it's like for people who were actively engaged uh, in a community that, like America, was heavily racialized and produced different outcomes depending on where you lived and what you look like. So we have a variety of perspectives from people who uh, have experience going, going back multiple generations or who have uh, forged a path which has led to a life 
in Arlington that continues on to this day. So we are going to uh, be open to hearing those reflections, but we did offer some guiding questions that we would like for the panelists to address, uh, just to let you know what those are. We wanted them to give us a sense of the Arlington neighborhood in which they grew up, they lived uh, during the period that they are going to reflect on tonight, and to give us some really fond memories of what community life was like in the neighborhood within the overall context of a racialized, segregated, uh, difficult community. And at the same time, are there any memories that are really painful and difficult to recall, if they could share those with us? And then, you know, really to the whole point of why we're here tonight, if they could reflect on why it's important that we gather periodically to reflect on our county's history, even when it is difficult, and what the history of segregation and the struggle for civil rights should mean to us all today. And then, uh, really for our panelists to ponder and really for us all to ponder, uh, how do we as a community, uh, given what we have heard tonight, what we will hear tonight, what can we do to honor and to learn from that history so that our future is not replete with the same mistakes of the past? So with that, why don't we begin in the order in which you were all introduced, which will be at the far end of the table, Dr. Alfred Taylor. I grew up in the Green Valley community uh, Thank you. a few years ago and experienced uh, <laughs> growing up in the community uh, when times were a little challenging between individuals in different communities and uh, race. But the Green Valley community to me was always a village. It was truly a village where everyone was a member of the extended family, meaning that you could do no wrong because one of your family members was uh, somewhere to watch you and had the, all the authority appertaining to your rear end if they <laughs> caught you uh, somewhere. Uh, but I went to Arlington County Schools only until the third grade. Then my parents transferred me to Washington, D.C. schools. And it was a funny thing to tell how great the schools were during that time. Although during the era, you know that Washington, D.C. was noted for having the best school system among African-American communities uh, in the area. But the credit to me, when I went from Arlington schools to Washington schools, I was put up a grade, which showed that our teachers uh, had really prepared us uh, for what we were to be faced with. So the growing up in that community was a great community Yes, I played the game of uh, pretending to live in the district by playing the game of ducking the officials so that my parents would not have to pay uh, out-of-state <laughs> fees. But uh, I consider growing up in the Green Valley community was no different than growing up in the Halls Hill community all the uh, Johnson Hill or Arlington View community. They were all a bonded group who were very concerned about what we did with our lives. They were very concerned that despite the times, we were provided with the best of opportunities. Uh, one of the things that I like to tell, and somebody, some of them may think it's all right, but we were always taught that we were just as good as the white kids. Yep. That was dwelled in our heads. But we couldn't go to Glen Echo. But we couldn't go to Washington Lee. Yep. But we couldn't, but we couldn't. So when integration first came about, they said, well, Dr. Taylor, what do you think? Well, Alfred Taylor did that. What do you think about integration? I said, what do I think about it? I think the but have been removed. <laughs> no difference in me or what we had, it was just that now 
We could go to the places, but going to those places did nothing to improve our lives or do us any better because our parents, through all of the sacrifices, ensured that we were afforded with the best of experiences, the best of opportunities, the best of education that was uh, available to us at that time, despite all of the th obstacles that were thrown into our plate. And I'll let someone else move on, and I'll do it again. Okay. Um, hopefully, you can hear me. Um, I grew up in the Buckingham Apartments, um, which were, you know, cutting edge of garden apartments then, and it was a more diverse community than one might think because it was the only place in Arlington that Jews could rent. And most of my playmates were from liberal New York Jewish families. Their parents had come down for those good government jobs under the New Deal, under Roosevelt. And how my parents ended up in Buckingham, I have no idea, but I'm glad they did. Um, and also, we were near St. Thomas More, so we had all these Irish Catholic kids. Um, and that we ha all had to get along and play together. And the Jewish kids were told they could not tell the Christian kids that there was no Santa Claus and there was no Easter Bunny. <laughs> and I found out not that many years ago that all of the Christian kids Christmas presents were hidden in the tops of the closets of the Jewish kids. And they knew what we were getting for Christmas, but they couldn't tell us that either. So um, I think that had a lot of influence on me, um, particularly the liberal New York Jewish folks who were not trying to, you know, impress their ideas upon us directly, but just sort of through osmosis. Now, my best memory of that, I could outclimb any boy in the neighborhood when it came to trees. I could get up the highest. And some old, we had a few retired military folks, and one lady would yell at us, her husband was a retired army officer, that we best get down from there or they were going to call Mrs. Buckingham. I don't know who Mrs. Buckingham was, <laughs> but we, we would get down. It was a good place to grow up, and I was just basically oblivious to the racial segregation, so I can't speak to that. I'm just, you know, the divergent person up here. <laughs> and um, I'm glad I had that experience. And I know that the restricted covenants existed all over. Uh, this, I'll tell one story that's a little bit later. I live in Barcroft community um, since 1970. And a few years ago, maybe 20 years ago, they decided with the community association that they perhaps should revise their, you know, check out their chart, their bylaws and everything, that there might be something they want to change. And they did find that they denied membership to Jews, Catholics, Arabs, blacks, and you know, who knows who else, I don't know. I wasn't on the committee. But they definitely had to make some changes because the head, the president of the Civic Association, which is a hard job to fill, was a Catholic Palestinian. Mm -hmm. So time to change the rules. <laughs> or you might get stuck being president. So Arlington has changed a lot, but I think we forget where we've come from at our own peril. Well, I'm kitty like a cat, but I'm not that dangerous. <laughs> the thing that I love most about my name is that it taught me to fight at a very early age. It comes from this here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Well, anyway. I grew up in Halls Hill, Havu Park. I still call it Halls Hill, sometimes Havu Park. But I grew up on the hill. And, and like Dr. Taylor said, we were really like an extended community across because one of the best kissers in Arlington County grew up in the valley. 
The other greatest kids in the Arlington grew up on Halls Hill. I never made it to HB, so I, I, I don't know. Um, but it was just really, really great growing up. My fondest memory, quite interestingly enough for me, as I thought about the questions you asked us to focus on, was learning how to skate on my roller skates around the main campus of the Department of Health and Human Services, if you will, there on North Edison and North 19th Street. Now to become something with the hospital. I, I just see the fences now. I don't know what they're doing. But that's where I learned to skate. And I still have the scar on my knee where I fell. That, that is my fondest memory because the sidewalk was just so poorly done that you could get real good speed and had to make a hop over one big crack and one of the slabs, and then you just kind of slide on around the building, all the way around the side. Um, loved it, absolutely loved it. But when I think about that, which was most difficult for me, was the civil rights movement and the march on Washington. My father, um, who I still love with all my heart, Captain Alfred Warren Clark. There at Fire Station 8, and I can remember eavesdropping on the conversation the fire chief had with him when the march was coming to D.C. And the short part of the story was the Arlington County Police Department had been ordered to pick up any Negroes walking the streets of Arlington during the time of the march. And they wanted to make sure that his children did not get caught up in the net. And I can remember watching the expression of my mother's face about what, what is this? How can you come in someone's home and tell them they can't walk their own streets? It was like, this isn't real. This, what is this all about? And she kind of looked at me and caught my eyes as if to say, just listen and learn. And my father said something on the order of, but this is our home. I bought this house so my children can grow up here, learn, go to school here, go to the playground if they want to here. And then you're telling me I can't let them walk out in their own yard on their own street? He said, well, I'm just telling you. I'm telling you what the order is, and that's what's going to happen. If they're going to do one of two things. They're going to lock them up, or they're going to drop them off on one of those bridges going back to D.C. They cannot be on the streets of Arlington. And being a young child and having to hear that about somebody that somebody either voted for or hired or put in responsibility, responsible positions, to feel that way about someone that just looked like me. That was a very hard thing for me to have to deal with. I think that was the most difficult, just having to deal with that reality. And on a personal level, if that wasn't personal enough, I missed the civil rights movement. It was literally in my front yard, and I couldn't go. I was a very obedient child to my parents to this day, so I'm really cleaning up the thoughts that are in my head to speak to you tonight. Um, and it was just incredibly difficult. I do have to say my brother said, we hear you, Daddy. OK, Mama, don't worry. And they snuck out the house and came back and brought me the news. <laughs> so it, at least I got to hear you know, one degree of separation from literally being there at the march, going there to Poverty City, um, seeing how people were being treated. And, the, and then our friends coming from other parts of the D.C. metropolitan area going around the Beltway through Falls Church to sneak into Arlington. It's not funny now. It wasn't funny then. But it is a memory. Hi, I'm Barbara Baskerville. Um, I lived in um, Halls Hill. I still call it Halls Hill. Mm -hmm. um, I, my fondest memories were coming down um, as a child, coming down to Arlington because uh, my family moved to uh, New Jersey when I was three. So my mother sent me down here every summer and I really hated to go back because there were so many things that I could do down here. Um, I got shot at by uh, Mr. Chin trying to steal his cherries. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, we would 
uh, put a pool in the backyard and we had a well, so we would get the water from the well so we could swim, but we had to wait a half a day because the water was so cold you couldn't get in it. But Halls Hill was a village. Everybody looked after everybody else's child. If you did something, boy, you were scared to come home because they had already told your mother what you did. And if you didn't get a spanking, you sure got something anyway. But mainly because most of the inhabitants of Halls Hill were actually slaves who came that were brought here from Freedom's Village. And actually, it's a whole lot of families still there. So it was a safe place. That's what I thought. So thank you all for taking us to those early recollections and what you've all described to some degree, um, despite tough circumstances, things that you observed that were personally difficult or that you questioned were the uh, joys of childhood, the joys that you get from being a child with other children, but also being in a community that was, I think you've all described something that is incredibly nurturing and maybe doesn't resemble the communities that we have today where um, you know, it takes a village, that's yeah. the concept, and where everyone was looking out for other people's children. But if we could, if I could ask for you to, uh, to pinpoint, and Kitty, you did this, but if all of you uh, wouldn't mind sharing a, a really difficult memory of something that you experienced growing up where uh, a segregated, racialized place was really thrust on you personally, um, I think it would benefit all if you're, if you're able to, to share it tonight. When, <clears throat> when we were going to school, uh, most of the uh, students for, that were going to D.C. schools at the time used to ride the four o'clock bus from Roslyn. Although we went to different schools within the district, we would all wait at Roslyn, meet at Roslyn in the evening, because during those days we went to school from nine to three. And we would all gather in Roslyn for the four o'clock bus. Well, all of the adults would not ride the four o'clock bus because they know it was full of school kids. It was gonna be noisy, unruly. The law at the time was the bus ride law in Virginia that you had to be seated behind a white. So we didn't have to worry about it because everyone knew about what was happening on the school bus uh, at four o'clock. So people shot away from the four o'clock bus. Mm -hmm. So about one particular day in Roslyn, the, the bus uh, started at Roslyn and ran from Roslyn to Green Valley. Uh, a white lady got on in Roslyn and the bus driver told us that, all right, you have to move back. And on this particular day, we say we're not going anywhere. And the bus driver say, well, I'm not moving the bus. And we say, we're not moving. They said, you know, I was, wasn't in that. They said, we not. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I wasn't part of that. <laughs> My parents might come back and whip me today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I say, no, we're not moving. So finally, after a long wait, the lady got off the bus. The bus driver closed the door drove us straight to Arlington County Courthouse. Oh, wow. Summoned a policeman. The policeman came out and he said, all right, you kid, you all know the law. Say, you know, why don't y'all go ahead and do what you're supposed to do? You know, if I told your parents all about this, you would all be in trouble. And the sad part about it was they were true that we could not go home and tell our parents that we had defied the law because regardless of what it was for, we would have been in trouble for defying the law. Yep. So uh, that was one of the main things that always stuck with me is, you know, everyone celebrates Rosa Parks and all of that, but as a group of kids, we long before Rosa Parks defied the law but we could not publicize it because the thing that was dwelled into all of our heads was that you don't break the law. As each day I went out the door to do something, 
My father had one word for me. You are a tailor. Mm -hmm. Remember, you are a tailor. And that was how we grew up. You do nothing, you do nothing to embarrass the family name. And if we had been really locked up, it would have been, we would have been in more trouble. Mm -hmm. And that, so that was one of the things, oh, I have many that I could come by, you know, in 86 years I experienced a lot. Um, Mr. Jones. Thank well, you, Dr. Taylor. I guess I better pass on this one. <laughs> Well, but Joan, you can you can sort of fast forward the timeline a little bit because oh. you you were you were very modest in talking about um, you know your role as a civil rights activist and some of the things that you experienced personally. Um, so you can you can fast forward the timeline from t childhood to talk about your experiences as a young adult. Well, we used to have drug fairs and uh, peoples. Some of you all remember those, <laughs> and they had those segregated lunch counters. Yes, so did. Oh and I had gotten involved in sit-ins in Durham, North Carolina, picket lines and sit-ins, when the students from North Carolina College came over to a meeting at Duke and invited us to join them. So some of us did, and I got myself a <clears throat> little experience at the lunch segregated lunch counters in the jail cells. <laughs> And um, Duke University was not happy about this, so we ended up parting company, but I did get my credit hours before I split. <laughs> and the students at North Carolina College said, well, if you've gone up to Washington, we haven't heard anything from those Howard students since SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the student organization was formed on spring break. So go up to Howard and find out what they're doing if they're not doing anything, help them get started and let us know what's happening. Because, you know, back then, no internet, even a long distance phone call was a big deal. Mm -hmm. So I didn't quite know how to get to Howard, but I found my way there and asking around. And it turns out there was a group of students who had been involved in, I think, sympathy pickets and maybe a little something in Maryland. They were planning to have sit ins in Arlington. And when they found out, I knew a bit about sit-ins, and I was from Arlington, they invited me to join them. And so I did, and we started down at Peoples on Lee Highway, and things were real quiet, so half of us split and went up to Drug Fair up near um, Stratford, sort of a catty corner across the street from the old fire station. And um, oh, the it got a little ugly. The students from Stratford and WNL were coming up and sort of harassing us a bit. <coughs> and then the American Nazi Party made their rounds yes. with these ugly signs, Is We Is or Is We Ain't Equals, with a picture of an ape on one of them. And um, well, we just sat there and till the store closed, and then the police gave us safe passage to get in the cars to leave. So we sat in here and there around in Arlington, down in Sherlington. You know, there used to be a Woolworths there before it became trendy. And um, a Landsbergs and things. So we would, we would sit in for about a good week, maybe more like two. And then we called a cooling off period so that the um, store officials and the prosecuting attorney could talk or the um, officials could talk, and it turned out when we went back, we got served. Surprise. Mm. And it turns out the prosecuting attorney had announced that he was not going to prosecute under the state law, which had said that not only the people that sat together, but the people that enabled them to sit together, the you know, lunch counter manager, the preacher, the park ranger, whatever, to let people sit together, they could be arrested too. Well, basically these lunch counter managers were from these liberal New York Jewish families I had talked about, and they had no problem with serving us. They just weren't ready to go to jail that day. So they served us when they weren't going to jail, and then um, I think Fairfax County, which had said it would prosecute, said, well, if Arlington's not going to, we won't either. 
And then Alexandrian Falls Church fell into line, and um, the lunch counters and a lot of the eateries in Northern Virginia were open to everybody. Right. So then we thought, well, oh, well, let's, it's summer, let's go to the beach. You know, the Atlantic Ocean segregated, and then reality set in, and that was a bit of a commute if you were going to school. <laughs> so we went out to Glen Echo, and... <laughs> And I could go in and buy the tickets. I'd gone there always as a kid. I went in, got a handful of tickets, came back out and handed them out to the Howard students who got arrested sitting on the merry-go-round, ticket in hand. Oh and um, so we picketed all summer, you know. Thank you. <laughs> Judy? So many things come to mind. Um, one of those um, situations that I found really difficult when it came to the segregation and the integration was trying to find somewhere to eat. And um, my brother did do the sit-in at the People's. Good. He didn't make it down to drug fair. He might have been in trouble. But anyway, he, 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 did, he did get the People's. I heard about it. Um, but we could get something to take out of the store to eat. And there was a corner right there at the end as you step inside the door, and you could put in your order, and they would always give you paper items. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't get a glass of Coke, you'd get a paper cup of Coke, because they had to use the glass again. But, but be that as it may, just sort of going through that entire experience of dealing with it, and then somewhere between 17 or 16 and 17, I got to work in the Virginia room. That was the restaurant in the basement of the Heck Company. Oh yeah. And I was told I could only work the bay, the people that came to the counter, because I was not allowed to serve anybody in the dining room. So not only could I not eat in the dining room of the Virginia room, I couldn't even work in the dining room of the Virginia room. And one night, somebody didn't show up, a, a college student, you know how they worked during those times. And they said, well, somebody's got to serve this big party we have. Kitty, would you do it? And I said, well, I'm not allowed to go. You told me, I, whatever I do, do not go into that dining room to work because it would be unlawful and I'll get in trouble if I break the law. Mm -hmm. So no, I can't do that. And they said, well, we are ordering you to do that. I said, are you sure I'll be able to put water glasses on the table? Are you sure I'll be able to keep the order straight? Are you sure? I, I, I rolled it, OK? And they said, you come back, and we'll t take this one over there. Take this. I, OK, I worked those people to death. All I had to do was just march out and put it there, march out and put it there. And then I got the biggest tip they had ever heard anybody get in the Virginia room. And somebody said, what did you do? I did my job. <laughs> <laughs> but I balanced that with the story that my mother told me. I was the baby for five years, so spoiled rotten. And she had gone to the heck company to buy something with the credit card that she and daddy had gotten. And apparently I was hungry. You can tell I don't miss many meals. And she said that I went off. I cried. I fussed. I knew better than roll around in the floor because I had my good clothes on. Oh, yeah. But I, I said, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. So they go up to the cashier. And you can remember they had it gated. You really couldn't even get in that yeah. thing. And, and so Mama said, my baby is hungry. I still have to get her home to get her lunch. Can I buy a bag of potato chips? We're, we don't want to come in and eat. We don't want to sit down. I just want to buy a bag of potato chips until I get my baby home. Mommy, I'm hungry. Mommy, I'm hungry. And the lady said, I'm sorry. She, Mama said, I'll just put the money here. Just let me get the potato chips. And she said, but you know I can't serve you. I can't serve you. And my mother said, she said to that lady, you need to know how upset I am right now. Because I cannot feed my child 
in the same place where I just spent so many hundreds of dollars buying things that I want for my household, but I cannot feed my child. You won't even sell me a bag of potato chips. There's something very, very wrong with that. So it gave me great delight to work in the Virginia room. All right. <laughs> um, I had um, an ordeal one day. Um, Mrs. Hom asked some of um, the kids, the plaintiffs that were trying to get into uh, Stratford, uh, to go to a meeting at the Unitarian Church. And if I, re I recall that she left us in a, a space near the door where you come in and walked away somewhere. I think we were there because the children who were the plaintiffs that were gonna, uh, trying to get into school had to go and take classes and etiquette and all this kind of stuff before we could get, you know, just, just to show that we could be like other kids. And we were standing there. I think there was about four or five young ladies. And I think we were 12 or 13 years old. I, I can't remember. I'm 75, so my memory's not real, real good. Um, but the um, Rockwell had a headquarters, which was right across from WNL. The American Nazi Party. Yes. George Rockwell. Yes. And so they came into that. Uh, church and um, they frightened us to death because all oh, they were clicking their heels and they were clicking the guns and um, you know little girls we were scared we were scared to death and I can tell you that it was years before I ever got over that mm -hmm. but I don't think that people realized there was actually a headquarters here a Nazi headquarters here mm -hmm. right near a, a school where there were children and all and actually, I guess it was two years ago it was knocked down. Mm -hmm. the, the building, it was an ugly green house. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. ugly green house. And it just, it was just, I, I just never forgotten that, never. I think even as an adult, I still remember. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barbara. And we've been joined by Portia Clark, president of the Green Valley Civic Association. Mm -hmm. And, and welcome, Portia. And uh, you know, we're at the point where we've had reflections from all of the panel about uh, the neighborhood that they grew up in, and they've shared some fond childhood memories. And then we've also gotten into what were some difficult childhood memories in an Arlington that was racialized and segregated, and um, you know, very much what we hope different than what it is today. But we were just having some reflections on all of that. So if you're ready, we'd love to have you uh, join in. Okay, well, I'm, I'm originally from Green Valley, um, not born there because of the times, but raised there the rest of my, all of my life so far. Um, and back then, it was Green Valley, and today, again, it is Green Valley, because at one point it became known as Knock. But those of us from there always knew we lived in Green Valley. So I guess one of my fondest memories of growing up was having the component of family. Um, my family, all from the area, still mostly live around the area. And it was that connection and bonding that the families had. My mother and her siblings, they took care of each other. And that was a strong family component. So wherever we lived in the community, you had that family bonding, whether it was with relatives or neighbors. Um, and then what happened in 1971 was a drastic change for us because the schools were desegregated. And at that time, I was going into middle school, and as a result of that, I ended up at Gunston, TJ, Hoffman, Boston, and then back to Hoffman, Boston when it became a model school. So it was kind of disruptive during those years um, because the schools were being desegregated, and yet we had some families that preferred that we stay, sec we stay segregated, but they wanted us to have equal access to books and funding. And that didn't always happen back then. So there was a group that led an effort to desegregate the schools, and at one point I asked, well, why all of this and what for? And somebody told me, oh, because if you all are sitting in class next to people who are achieving, you'll do better. So as a result of that, 
by the time my kids entered school and um, I had them, I had a, a daughter that went to four elementary schools before she got to fourth grade. And that was very disruptive. And it was one of those situations where it was difficult because I had to become an activist back then and we had to lobby the board so she wouldn't end up going to her fourth elementary school. We got caught up in what the practices were back then. If you lived on one side of the street, you went to one school and if you lived on the other side, you went to another school. And then by third grade, you had to go to a North Arlington school was one of the practices. So our kids ended up in Nottingham, Jamestown, and Tuckahoe. So it was very disruptive to that family component that we grew up with. You know, we couldn't go next door and have tea with the mom and talk about what happened in school. So as a result of some of that, I think it broke up our communities. And today, of course, I say back then, my mother and her siblings had a social media network, which wasn't internet, but the telephone, because they took care of each other. They called, found out what somebody needed, they provided it. Whether it was childcare, whether it was cooking, whether it was a ride to work, they provided it. And the same thing for our neighbors, whereas today we live in neighborhoods that are disconnected. Um, we've been gentrified somewhat, most of our, all three of our African American communities. And Green Valley was one of those last affordable neighborhoods that still had a large contingent of African Americans who lived in the community, owned their homes for more than 30 years. And now it's being gentrified even more because as those individuals die out, what's happening to their homes? Most of our kids can't afford to live in those communities. Um, they have to move to areas where they can afford to live. And then when they inherit the family home, they sell it. So a lot of that has happened to us. And I think that impacted our kids in school, which I've always wanted somebody to do a study and tell me what impact that had with breaking up Drew. And then for over 31 years at Drew, we had this elephant in the room called Montessori. And <laughs> we just got a neighborhood school back last year for the first time in all those years. So I will stop at that. If <laughs> You're getting fired up. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Portia. And you know, all, all of you are really describing something that I think is really important for us uh, as, as an audience that's privileged to hear this conversation. You're describing a period of segregation where um, it was arbitrary, it was clunky, and even as children experiencing it, many of its principles made absolutely no sense to you. Yet it was a world that you nonetheless had to understand the rules of operating. But the story doesn't end just simply when there was desegregation, because in some ways you're describing that desegregation was just as arbitrary and unhelpful in the ways in which it was implemented. And even though the narrative and the timeline is that we went from the evil days of segregation to the wonderful days of integration and inclusion, the truth is that it's a lot messier than that. So if we can just then shift towards the period of desegregation in Arlington, what are some things that we all need to know about how it, it may not have been as rosy as the story that we've been taught or would like to believe? I was a product of the segregated schools, so I, I graduated from school in 1952. That was two years before Brown versus Board of Education. So I went to uh, segregated schools. I went to, my parents sent me to Washington DC schools because at that time I had more choices in the DC schools than in the one school that was in Arlington school was Huffman Boston. Huffman Boston at the time was an unaccredited high school, no library, and very few. The teachers there were excellent, but the facilities and the resources uh, stood a lot. So my parents transferred me to DC schools. My parents were natives of DC and they were products of DC public schools, uh, having been uh, born in the Foggy Bottom section of uh, Washington, DC. Uh, I 
went to D.C. schools because it afforded us more choices. In fact, at the time, during the segregated days, there were five high schools for our blacks in Washington, D.C. There was Dunbar High School, which was noted mostly as a college preparatory high school. And you might say, uh, what was different about Dunbar? What I could say was different about Dunbar was about 75% of their staff possess PhDs. They taught in the District of Columbia Public Schools because at that time the public schools in the District of Columbia was supported by Congress and got more money than the state schools got. A teacher could make more teaching in a DC public school with their doctorate than teaching at a historically black college, which at that time were mostly funded by churches who were struggling the own south. I went to uh, Armstrong Technical High, and uh, a lot of the other kids, some of the things you may know about uh, some of my classmates who graduated from uh, Armstrong was, uh, we were also taught college preparatory, but on a technical basis. The University of District of Columbia, from which I retired from after 31 years, <clears throat> was designed. The architects were the Bryan brothers who grew up in Green Valley. And in 1979, were known as the world, world's richest uh, architecture, black architecture firm with some over 700 products, projects. Here in Arlington, you can see results of their work when you see the Macedonia Baptist Church was designed by the Bryan Brothers, Mount Salvation uh, Baptist Church in uh, Halls Hill, Highview Park, was uh, designed, Fort Lincoln Newtown, Dunbar High School. So out of our community and out of the Armstrong graduates, a lot, excuse me, a lot of, of the students were taught the technical aspect. We also had Cardoza High School, which had a business emphasis. And I would have to say that uh, Cardoza was where all of the females were, uh, <laughs> simply because it was a business oriented. The town was a business oriented town, and young ladies could go to uh, Cardoza, learn to type 35 words a minute, and get a job in the federal government. So a lot of the females went to uh, Cardoza. We had Phelps Vocational, which was a boys' vocational school, and Margaret Washington, not Martha, Margaret. Margaret Washington was a girls' vocational school. So we could take advantage. That's why a lot of the kids went from Arlington to D.C. schools, simply because of choices not before quality of teaching, because I told you earlier, when I went from Arlington schools to DC schools, I was put up a grade. If so, but it was for the resources and the choices that the DC schools offered the kids. Uh, until 1946, if your parents worked for the federal government, you could go to DC schools regardless of where you lived. In 1946, they started cha charging tuition for out-of-state students, and a lot of the students then had to transfer back into Hoffman, Boston, because the parents could not afford to pay the tuition that was uh, at that time. But the school system, the, the Hoffman, Boston teachers in the Huffman of Boston, they were excellent teachers well, with the challenges they had to face with using the hand-me-down books, you know, and things of that nature. But uh, that was my uh, schooling of coming into uh, the community, which I cannot speak for all of, the, of my education in the Arlington Public Schools, but what I did receive from the public school set me up to be where I am today. Thanks, Doc. 
And what about for you, Joan? What did the period of, of segregation bring that we don't often think about? Desegregation, excuse me. Desegregation. What well, in the schools, it became a little tricky because in the white schools, when black kids, the districts were redrawn, I'm thinking in the 70s, when my kids were in school, then how are the new kids received? How are these colored? That was um, what they were y'all were called then, yeah. um, but it became like two, two separate groups in the school, not much mixing between them. Now my sons, if they liked you, they liked you. If they didn't like you, they didn't like you. And they caught a bunch of flack from uh, other white kids for having friends that had just been zoned in and I remember, I think his name was Reverend Hunter, but there was a minister whose kids were at Barcroft School, and he and I were, ended up speaking to the school board, and um, I can draw just so good when I need to, and I, I gave a nice Southern presentation on how if you know, if, if y'all up in North Arlington want your kids to have, a, you know, diverse classmates, don't you know that, you know, Glebe Road runs south as well as north? We'll make room for you down here. <laughs> and Reverend Hunter, man, he, he, he could, um, he could preach. <laughs> and um, he, he sort of did a good Jesse Jackson imitation, almost as good as my Southern Bell imitation, and um, made it clear that we, we could integrate schools in the South with, you know, you white folks from up North, and um, so that we had that experience, and they ended up not closing Barcroft School um, after that, which they had were threatening to do, but I remember one of my sons, when he was in kindergarten, there was this black kid who didn't seem to have any friends, and my son became friends with him. And I said, well, years later, what, why did you like Eric? I think his name was Eric. He said, well, he had the same shirt that I did. We had matching shirts. Well, I knew both of them had hand-me-down shirts from Sears and Robux. <laughs> It was just interesting to see the different perspectives, and I think my sons had their perspective because of my involvement um, in the civil rights movement and stuff. They, they'll tell you they didn't know anything about that, but I'll tell you they weren't listening. They were just looking for a chance to you know, go play when all those old folks were hashing over their war stories from the sit-ins and all. But um, it was sort of tricky where they were redrawing lines and busing kids and the folks who were getting, the new kids coming in, the old folks weren't liking the new kids and I reckon that made it pretty hard for them. I'd say, um, you know, back then churches certainly were very powerful and we had some ministers like Reverend Hunter even before him, Reverend Robinson, Reverend Walls and those that came out and helped to fight those battles that we had to go through during those times. I only wish those churches was as active today in the communities because they don't live in the community as much anymore. Mm -hmm. But that really helped us during those days, particularly with me coming along after all the 60s movement and us growing up learning how to be activists at an early age. Uh, one of my fondest memories at Drew was third grade in Miss Hazeline Harris's class, the day Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. It was a blessing to be in her class and for the warmth and the guidance that she gave us during those years. Because in that class that day, we all cried. Um, and we were still segregated at the time. But following that, we were instrumental in helping with, I'd like to say, getting it as a holiday because we would skip school, go downtown to the marches. We would do things to advocate for what was going on at the time that wasn't right. Um, when my kids entered school, I guess the issue of even talking about Barcroft, I ended up becoming president of the PTA. And that was the group that I engaged with to go to the school board to say, 
we did not want to move our kids again, and my daughter was not going to go to a fourth elementary school, and we won that battle that year. I will say my middle daughter ended up being accepted at um, what was PAGE back then, which is ATS today, and one of the uh, most uh, let's just say, dawning moments we had with her having this opportunity to go to um, a school that was very diverse, well, not very diverse because it was not that many African-American students in the school. But I happened to take my nieces and nephews, and one night we were going to the science fair, and my daughter had a project she had done. And we ended up at the science fair going through all the exhibits, and my niece looked at the exhibit next to my daughter's and asked the student if she could touch it. And the little girl said no. And my niece didn't understand that. And when she asked why, she said, because you're black. Yeah. So that was an opportunity for those students who really hadn't experienced what we had experienced growing up with situations like that. But she had let my daughter touch it because my daughter was in the class. But when she responded, it was, no, she couldn't touch it just because of the color of her skin. But it gave us an opportunity to educate them and to talk to them some more. And I think they learned a great deal that year about it wasn't about the color of your skin um, because they ended up playing together and learning who my nieces and nephews were, and they all ended up getting along. I had the um, honor, and I still try to frame it that way, even in my own heart, to be part of that graduate, um, no, integrating class at Swanson Junior High School. And I was on the hockey field when Kennedy was assassinated. And I can remember almost getting into a fight because I could not believe that someone would kill our president. That was just so hard to just absorb that. But be that as it may, I had to get over the disappointment of not having gone to Hoffman Boston and, and known Mr. Griffin and all of those different kinds of things that my older brothers and sister told me about that I was looking forward to. And one of the worst experiences I had in Arlington County Public Schools was my counseling session with the career counselor where everyone else was talking college preparation she informed me that it was very nice and very clean and that I would make a great maid. And, and, and then she offered me a job for the summer. And I, I had to make my brain say, don't get into trouble. Mm. You know what your mother would expect you to say. And so I had to inform her that I, I knew I had other plans for myself and I knew my parents had other plans for me. Why is it that we can't visit places like Virginia State or Howard or, or uh, Morgan State or something like that? And she didn't know what I was talking about. And I can remember thinking, why would you not want to learn what historical black colleges and universities are in this country? Why would you not have prepared yourself for those of us that were being forced I was the last class at Langston in sixth grade that had the choice. That was the last year we could choose to go to HB. My mom and daddy said, you're going to Swanson. So I didn't have a choice. <laughs> but that's okay. Y'all know how obedient I am. And, 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 and so I'm there. And I never did tell my mother how that session went with the counselor. And, and, I, and I told her, I said, well, I don't think she can really help me because she doesn't understand what I need. And she said, well, do I need to talk to her? I said, oh, no, no. If, if that one had told my mom she was going to turn me to her summer maid, we'd have made the papers. We would have made the papers. And, 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 so, and, and so, you know, that, that still bothers me, obviously, to, to just try to deal with not understanding what we would need and how rich that was at HB for us and my brothers and my sisters and the generations before and my mom's siblings and, and all of that, that, that was something that integration took away from me and did not develop a plan to bridge or replace, to recover. And we were the children. And then the classes that came after us, um, before you even got there in the 70s, they too had to have the briefings on how we behave in this integrated situation, 
but they had to learn how to eat fried chicken with a knife and a fork. <laughs> and when they told me that, I said, oh yeah, I really need to go early <laughs> because that's not how you eat fried chicken. <laughs> but, but be that as it may, etiquette, etiquette and proper manners, you know, you had to go through all that. But the piece that really gagged me with the proverbial spoon, and I'm gonna try to make this sound nicer than it is in my head, but you know that Washington Golf and Country Club up there on North Glebe Road? <laughs> that same one. Um, Swanson would hold its eighth grade prom thing up there. And we were all excited about that. And we were hooking up dates. Now, you know I had to date a cousin, because that's all we got up there, right? <laughs> but anyway, we were getting our dresses and things together to go to this prom, and all of a sudden we were told that we couldn't hold the prom that year. And none of us kids could understand that. We did the homework, we passed the test, we behaved, we were winning championships and all that good stuff. We can't go to prom, what's up with that? Fortunately, one of my white girlfriends, whose mother worked for the Arlington County School Board, gave the backstory. And the backstory was, is that they would not allow us to come in because we were Negroes. And so they wouldn't allow us to hold the prom up there that year. And Swanson had just put in a whole brand new gym floor. And they were saying, well, we can hold it in the gym. Well, it would be different than what all the other eighth grade classes that had at Swanson for I don't know how long, but that was okay. But then we were told we couldn't wear our shoes. You got a pretty dress and can't wear your <laughs> shoes. But anyway, you can't wear your shoes. And I said, well, then what are we supposed to do? Everybody had to go out and buy these nice socks, <laughs> fancy socks. You should have seen us dressing up these socks trying to make them look like shoes. <laughs> we were going to the prom. And, and then they decorated it. I can remember the balloons and the streamers and the colors. And we had a lot of raw, raw, raw school spirit. And we really had a pretty good time. And then I remember how careful we were not to tell everybody why we really couldn't hold the prom, where it had been held as a tradition for so many years. And, and you know, we, we could have worn socks at the Washington Golf and Country Club if they were worried about their floor. You know, we could have done that. But that's life in Arlington. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'd like to introduce some things that a lot, I believe a lot of people don't know anything about here in Arlington. Um, I remember my mom told me that um, when it was time for me to be born, uh, black women couldn't have babies at Arlington Hospital, and I was three blocks away. Yep. She, we were living three blocks away. And so um, she had to go into the District of Columbia to what was named then Freedman's Hospital. Yep. As some say it was for the free from the mm -hmm. slaves yep. from mm -hmm. Arlington Freedman. Cemetery. Um, and so um, I kept, I always asked her why, why, why we couldn't go over there, everybody else went. Mm -hmm. And she would say, Barbara, because we're black. Mm -hmm. There are other issues that uh, we had there in, um, in Halls Hill. Um, there was Arlington Hospital and black patients could only be on one hall. It was called a hall. Yeah. And if there was not a room for you, or they didn't have a place for a bed for you, mm -hmm. then you were in a hall's hall yeah. with, with yeah. things hanging off of you. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I was in my 12th year at WNL when my mother had to have surgery. <coughs> and we, my brother and I, um, took her to the hospital, and the candy striper went past a hall. And I stopped her, I said, oh, wait, 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 hon. I said, um, we, have to come, we have to go back here. And she said, no, I'm taking her to the second, second floor. And I said, well, you're gonna get in trouble, because mm -hmm. we only go on a hall. Mm -hmm. And I know it was 1963, and um, she told me, she said, no, um, Here's the paper, and it had the room number and everything on it. And Reggie and I almost fainted because I, we didn't, I don't know when it started, but Arlington Hospital was close enough for us to know that if they made that change, 
we should have known. So it was, it hadn't been very long that they'd been able to go there. Um, what else was I thinking about? Um, I'm, I'm 75 now, so you ought to bear with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's one other thing I wonder? I'll, I'll tell you what, let's go on and okay. let someone else. Uh, Ms. Dulles, on the Arlington uh, Hospital story, I would like to yes. just take that a little further. In 1934, uh, Dr. Roland H. Bruno was hired by Arlington County to work in their public health uh, service. He was hired to uh, teach uh, Planned Parenthood to black black females. Uh, the Public Health Bureau was in Clarendon at the time. Uh, but they would not let Dr. Bruno teach or practice in the public health center. They opened up a room in the Arlington County Jail for him to teach black females Planned Parenthood. Dr. Bruna, the reason I know the story so well, Dr. Bruna opened his practice in Green Valley in July of 1934, and I had the honor of being his first delivery. Because at the time, as was said earlier, Arlington Hospital would not accept the outpart. So you were either born at home with a midwife or the now we had a doctor in the community to assist you, or you had to go to Friedman's yeah. Hospital. Yeah. You may see friendly cabs on the street now. That was how friendly cabs started. Oh that Mr. Ralph Collins used to transport people from Green Valley to Freeman's Hospital, because that's where we had to go all the way over there for medical service, because Arlington Hospital would not, was not a welcoming place. And out of it, it went involved into the friendly cabs there, that you see the friendly cabs on the street now, where there are 49 cabs, and the family still owns the franchise to that and live in the Green Valley community. So there are a lot of stories out that we could go on that because of the obstacles that was thrown before us made us have to do our own thing and be our own business and out of it evolved a lot of things, a lot of practices that the African American communities the three major communities, I say, we had some mono. Most people didn't even know we that we had an African American presence in Boston, Virginia. Yep. Most people don't know we had an African American community in Roslyn, Virginia. Mm-hmm. But the three major don't know that forerunner of the Penrose was Butler Holmes in there. Mm-hmm. So we really had three major and some minor spots around. But in all of those communities, we had to do for ourselves. Uh, Genadine Playground, as you may know it now, was purchased from an African-American family by the county, then told the people that all we needed was the sports field. When they purchased it, it had an entertainment complex there. We had dance hall, we had motorcycle, dirt track, racing and things, Arlington County, purchased it in 1942 and said all we needed was athletic fields and took away everything. So Arlington County may be this progressive county now, but Arlington County has some in its closet. A lot of stuff in its closet. My father worked for Arlington County government for for 44 years. For 44 years. When my father retired from the county, he was the assistant superintendent of the sanitation division. At the time, as an African-American who worked for Arlington County, there was only two divisions you could work in, or the public works, or you could work in the sanitation division. My fault, I happen to be blessed with a photographic memory. So if you want to know some stories on what Arlington County, let me talk to you offline sometime. <laughs> I have one other thing. I Go ahead, Barbara, absolutely. Um, we had a theater in Arlington. It was on Glebe Road. It's called the Glebe. And of course, we weren't allowed to go there. 
And so um, it was eventually uh, my mom sued the theater. And um, I said, well, mom, why, why are you suing them? She said, I said, you, you're not going to go. She said, that's all right. I'm, you'll get to go. And so she sued them. She won. And then she got a letter from them. I think what the confusion was, they thought her name was Freddie. I think they thought she was a male. And maybe that's why they sent such a nasty letter. But it didn't make any difference um, because that was a victory for her. And um, she used to get telephone calls all the time, and they'd tell her that her days were numbered. And she would tell them, yours are too. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for just for really being so generous with, uh, you know, sharing reflections uh, to the questions that we pose to you. We'd love to have uh, some questions that, that are coming from our audience. So uh, just once I recognize you, a microphone will be brought to you. I have uh, the gentleman there and then Mr. Vice that over here. A, a question for Kitty and uh, Barbara. Can, can you describe the... Uh, the small businesses uh, in Halls Hill that serve the community and, and a couple along Lee, uh, uh, Lee Highway, and also uh, uh, the segregation wall. Um, and Doc, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Taylor, could you talk a little bit about uh, Doc Muse and the uh, Green Valley Pharmacy? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, my favorite business store was next door to my home, uh, Miss Allen's yes. Penny Candy Store. Um, you could get pickles, this, well, they weren't that big, but you could get huge pickles, yep. five uh, about five cents, they eat them all day long. Um, if you ever got a loose tooth, go get a Mary Jane. Yeah. You, you didn't have to pull them out, just chew on a Mary Jane. That, that got that tooth out. Um, <laughs> and, and so that was on this side of Lee Highway. And so I wasn't able to go across the street unless I was taken across the street. And the, the business that I went to most often across the street was the Suburban Night. That, that was the bar. Um, uh, what were you doing there? Uh, Daddy took me for orange soda. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> going Suburban Night? I, I, Daddy took me for an orange soda. That's my story. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sticking to it. And I'm sticking to it. And, and if your mama asked, what did you have? You had an orange soda. And it was a big crush bottle. And so I could, I could remember. I couldn't mess that up. But, um, but that would be my time that I would spend with him. And so he would take me across the street. It was right near the fire department. So I got to do that. I remember the Safeway that's now a tire and battery store. Um, that was the only one we had up on the hill. Um, and then I remember the business for Heidelberg is now. And I can't remember the gentleman who owned the store, but it was right across the street from Langston, and we could go there and get potato chips and a soda before we went to class. Please don't tell my mother. <laughs> uh, and potato chips, orange crush, Mary Janes, and all right. <laughs> hey. Barbara, do you want to share any from the Hill before we go down to Green Valley and, and talk about Dr. Muse? Oh, gee, I don't think I can... I don't think I can think of much else. Um, my uh, family has been in Hall's Hill for five generations, but at three, I moved to New Jersey. That's right. And that was the, really the only reason I was allowed uh, to be in the group. The, the first five, they were straight A students, I wasn't. The only reason I was allowed to go, the criteria was you had to have lived around or had associated with um, people of different color. And, I, and, and my neighbors were Ethiopians and um, Mexicans and Jews. In fact, my, the lady I call my godmother was a Holocaust survivor. And she took care of me while my mom worked for her. Mm. You know, that, those days they called it day's work. And, um, for taking care of me, I learned so much, so much. Um, um, it was just, I, I've had a real good life. Let me just say that. Oh, listen. I have enjoyed everything that has gone on in my life. God has been very good to me. Oh, yeah. wow. Thank you. Well, uh, 
Another interesting story before I talk about Dr. Muse, but in 1913, my grandfather moved from uh, Butt Land from John D. Nock in 1913 to build this home when he moved over from Foggy Bottom. And that's who the community was named after, oh, well, named from John D. Nock. But Doc Muse, prior to 1952, Doc Muse, we, uh, as was said earlier, we did not have the privilege of sitting at a fountain to get like a fountain coat when on a split of what? because we could not sit at any of the drugstore counters like People's Drug Fair or any of them. So Doc Muse, uh, when he built the drugstore in 1952 uh, and put the counter in, that was the first opportunity. It wasn't the first time we were at the counter because we used to go to Washington, D.C. and to the theaters on U Street, and we were able to sit the on counters at... Uh, at some of the places, like the you and me on U Street or things of that nature, but as far as Virginia was concerned. So Doc Muse opened his drugstore in 1952 and put in the first counter where we had the privilege of sitting down, getting fountain cokes, cherry cokes, banana splits, and milkshakes, real milkshakes, you know, things of that nature. So that was, uh, and Dr. Muse, uh, ran that. The thing about Dr. Muse, until he died, he was in that drugstore. Dr. Muse opened that drugstore, it was not, I, every, I guess every generation since when he opened it, went through Doc's drugstore. Yep. You know, that was the gathering place at Doc's drugstore. During the doo-wop days, that's where we went and stood up there at our little doo-wop singing and things. Mm. But Doc kept his drugstore open. He never turned anyone away. People came who needed medicine, may or may not have been in position, but Doc Muse ran more than a drugstore. He ran a community gathering place that lasted for the 64, 62 years. Oh, well, the reason I can remember the year that he opened it, because that was the year I got married, 1952. All right. <laughs> Portia, you want to share any Portia reflections work, Dr. Man. Oh, yeah. In yeah. the late 60s, my mother used to run the food counter in the drugstore, and that was actually one of my first entrepreneurship opportunities, because she'd take me to work with her in the morning when she'd open up, and I would sell penny candy for Doc from the other side, because that wasn't open, and Doc didn't come in until later. So I started selling penny candy at Drew out of my locker. And <laughs> it was a nice business. Now and later, and Mary Jane's <laughs> went very well. But another story with Doc and my family, my, my dad and his brothers, my, un my uncle was uh, Galvester Crawley who ran the barbershop. And then my father and his brothers and all, when we would get sick, they'd go to Doc to get medicine. And for years, they always told us they went and got something that was called Save the Baby. And I'm thinking it's a real medicine that Doc had produced called Save the Baby, because whenever we took it, we were well, and we got better. <laughs> so one day, about, you know, right before uh, Doc, maybe about five or six years before Doc passed away, I said, Doc, do you remember Save the Baby? What was that? He said, oh, that wasn't nothing but some cod liver oil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but Doc served our community well, and we had a lot of businesses. If you had shoes that needed repairing, you went to Walker's Shoe Shop. Um, you went to uh, Miss Mackley for your hair to be done, who had her academy where Friendly Cab Stand was. But uh, the businesses grew around Green Valley, and I tell you, we supported them as a neighborhood, and that was some of that community component, that if you needed something, you needed, even one of my neighbors would tell me how her husband and his buddies would get together in the evenings, and they all helped build each other's houses. Right. Mm -hmm. And this, this was something they would do regularly, and she'd say how, well, you know, they'd get together and get a couple bottles, and if they, you know, finished their work, all I had to do was cook for them, 
and they built those houses. So there's several houses around the neighborhood that those guys built after getting off from their regular jobs. But again, that's a part of that community component where they took care of each other. You know, also, there was a restaurant that was called Shady Dale. During the time when they have to plow the streets when they had snowstorm and the restaurants were closed, the county had made provisions with the owners of the Shady Dale to stay open because then we used to have snowstorms. They would plow two or three days at a time. But we could not go in, we could not go to the white restaurants. But the county had made arrangement that their driver was white and black, anyone who had to work during the snowstorm could come in and eat at uh, Shady Dale. So, you know, it was, uh, things were never. So uh, there were a lot of businesses that started, as Portia said, her entrepreneurship started uh, when she was selling penny candy. <laughs> Mine started in junior high school when we used to take industrial art. And we used to take uh, half a year of printing, half a year of woodwork, a half a year of electricity, and a half a year of sheet metal. Mm -hmm. Well, when I took printing, I found out that I could print name cards with your name and address on it and sell it to kids for, you know, 10 for 10 cents. And that started me off with my entrepreneurial spirit, which was eventually grew, grew to, I own, have in my lifetime, I've owned two printing establishments and things. But it started, you know, we as, we had to make our own way and things and use our own creativeness in order to do a lot of things. We had to make our own toys and things. How much we were ahead of the game, think of it. A big wheel. Put a big wheel in your mind. Mm -hmm. You know how we used to make big wheels? When you outgrew the tricycle, mm -hmm. you turn the frame upside down, <laughs> and you put the seat in the curve, and just transfer the wheels. And that was a big wheel. That was before your time, before our time. <laughs> Somebody took that idea, and they made uh, a big wheel out of it. <laughs> we used to take barrel staves, and girls used to take the barrel staves, out of it, someone came up and called it the hula hoop. Okay. So most of the things we had to make, we made our own soapbox derbies and things of that nature, just by spare part, because we didn't, we're not, uh, and I, I'm not saying that to say I thought it was good, because it made us very creative mm. and things of that nature, that uh, not to have all of these things just given to us, but we had what we needed because it caused us to be creative and make a thing. You know, take a bicycle. We'd get all parts and make our own bicycles, so it didn't make it. All right. There was, uh, fourth there was one more question um, about the wall. Oh, yes. The, the yeah. separation yeah. wall. Thank you. And um, I, I just ignored the thing. Um, to be quite honest, and I'd climb over fences. I could still jump fences until I was about 25 years old, so I, I didn't let any of that bother me, but it was an, um, an embarrassment when we had company come. They go, why does this street run into the back of this house? What's, what's up with that, and why is this wall here? And if you don't know, there's still portions of that wall <laughs> that still exist today, even though they've cut the road through um, and I just sort of accepted that people do things like that when they're afraid and they don't understand. And it was always troubling that we sort of felt like we were put on a reservation because it was one way in one way and one way out. And they kind of always knew where you were. And between about 20th Street on the north side to 19th Street, um, there were the blacks on one side of George Mason Drive and the whites on the other side of George Mason Drive and it was not paved until I think 1967. And so you couldn't even go straight down George Mason Drive from north to south. We use it as a ball field, by the way. It, it, it worked out. If you still look at the North community, the North community has more paper streets than any community in, or Green Valley community, than any community in Arlington. 
the average street is three blocks long, so you can only get out. There's no cross streets. Each street is three blocks long. So you have to come all the way out your street mm -hmm. to go down the street to go into the next street if the house was right behind you. If you look at the North community now, or Green Valley, every street is still. If you ask them about Block M of North, they would shake their head and say, it's, it's hard to grid. But uh, those are some of the things, one way in and one way out, as the kitty said. In my presentations, I also asked in her, there was another wall, and there was another wall in Arlington besides the wall in Halls Hill. Anyone know where that was? No? Well, that's the one that's partially still That's there. the one they're talking about. Yeah. Well, the big wall for us on the south side was called Route 50. It divided the north side from the south side. Mm -hmm. North didn't go to south, and north, south didn't go to north. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who lived on the north side never went through the, to the south side. Mm -hmm. In my presentations now, when we say, uh, when we used to say, they would ask the question, well, where is north? I say right below Columbia. Oh, I thought that was Green Valley. I've never been there, but I've been through. Many, many people have gone to Charlington. Mm -hmm. and still don't know that they have come through the Green Valley neighborhood. Yep. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go fourth row in the middle here. Thanks. Really fascinating stories this evening. You're all leaders in your own right, and I'm wondering if you have any reminiscences about Frank Wilson, who got elected to the school board as an African American a number of decades ago, also, Judge Newman, the first African-American, having been elected to the county board. And then going back to the school board for a second, Evelyn Syfax, mm. an appointed African-American leader of the school board. What are your reminiscences and, and thoughts of, of those uh, folks? Thank you. I'm going to jump in first because she was my third and fourth grade teacher at Langston <laughs> Elementary School. So I got to hear her first baby's bump, breathe, and kick. And, and so I just absolutely love Mrs. Syfax and all of those things that she brought to us. With regard to um, Judge Newman, he was always a man of honor, a man of respect, a lot of fun when he was younger. I have no stories to tell. Okay. Um, and, and just an absolutely marvelous person. And Frank was like a second father to me, Wilson, was like a second father to me in so many ways. And what I loved about him being on the school board I had a child with special needs, and I found out that in the Arlington Public Schools, you had better learn how to self-advocate for your children, because the system is, <clears throat> you just needed to do that. <laughs> and, and I am the kind of person that believes that I do better inside of a system to improve it than to burn it down. That would get me in trouble with my father. My but, but outside of that, I, I just had to work within the system. And so I said to Frank, I said, I, I need to get on one of those boards that you all do there on the school board. And he says, what do you want? I said, I want the one that deals with special needs children. And he said, why? I said, because my son needs the help. And what I have learned is that if you don't seem to have someone with whom you can sit down and explain why your child's education is important to you, they don't seem to get it. And, and so I would really like the opportunity to do that. And he did that for me, along with a lot of other things that he did when he served on the Arlington County School Board. And um, a man of great honor for many reasons. But Mrs. Syfax, that's my girl. I will say, even before Ms. Syfax, we had Eleanor Monroe who was also a Green Valley resident and former PTA president at Drew, who was active during that period of time before desegregation of the schools, but the wife of Thomas Monroe. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm remembering um, Mrs. Syfax when she visited Barcroft School, and my, two of my kids were in kindergarten, and Geronimo, my baby, crawled up on her lap and she just gave him the biggest hug and let him sit there the whole time she was in the classroom. And for years, she would ask how he was doing. And um, so she, she really 
connected with the community, mm. even my son Geronimo. <laughs> I really do not approach this. Once I retired from the university, I taught in Arlington County Public Schools for five years. So I've experienced five Februaries. And each February was Black History Month, of course. But the assignments to the students were the same thing. Write me a paper on Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, the yeah, same yeah. national figures. I said, it really does not make sense when we have people in our own communities who made local, national, and international contributions. Why not let the people in their own communities learn about their own people? Everybody knows the national story. So that was the reason that I wrote my book, Bridge Builders of North Green Valley. And my book has about 90 some Thomas Munro's and Syfaxes and then that there are a lot of unknown people who made justice of contributions that students don't know about, some of their own relatives. So in order on Black History Month, rather than keep saluting and celebrating the national figures, I wanted them to start learning about their own heritage mm -hmm. and some of the people who made their own contributions. Hence was the uh, emphasis behind me publishing my first book uh, on the bridge builders. Bridge builders, you know, I even have people say, well, what you mean by bridge builders? They weren't bridge, physical bridge builders. It was bridge builders of paving the way for us who came away that they never got, some of them were, was before their time to get recognized for the contributions that they made. I'm a person who uh, adheres to the Sankofa bird syndrome. That you know the Sankofa bird was a bird who flies forward while looking backwards. Looking backwards to, and that's what we have to do, fly forward, look back, uh, while looking backwards. Looking back at our history to celebrate our history, not to dwell on it, but only to know where we come from so we can measure where we are today and how far we need to go. So we need to stop singling out and, and, and making martyrs out just a few of the African Americans because there's some unsung heroes who have made just as well contributions as those. Thank you. I want to tell another story on um, Black History Month. When it was um, first becoming in the early 80s a thing in the formerly all-white schools, the music teacher at Barcroft, an older white lady, asked me what would be a good song to teach the kids. She didn't want to teach a spiritual because that's, you know, so many kids of different religions in the school. And I said, well, you could teach them lift every voice and sing. She didn't have a clue about what that song, but she looked it up. She was wanting the song to teach the chorus. She taught it to every kid in the school. And at the big international potluck dinner that year, she had the chorus on the stage leading everybody in singing Lift Every Voice and Sing. So I think Barcroft was, beyond a doubt, the first formerly all-white school in Arlington to, for the, all the kids to learn it but probably in the entire state of Virginia. So I think Arlington is pretty good. <laughs> All right, so we've got a question here in the front row. Can, Microphone's coming to you. Uh, can someone, or either one of you, just tie Freedman's Village to Arlington Cemetery and how the land was traded out or swapped out or bought? Most people, Freedman's Village really started in Washington, D.C. And it started in the southeast section of Washington, D.C., on what was formerly the Providence Hospital grounds. Mm. Uh, it was the outbreak of uh, yellow fever and malaria, and they figured that uh, they needed to move the people to the open area. And uh, see, Friedman Village 
came from was run by the Freedmen's Bureau. That's where you got the name Freedmen's Hospital. Howard University is a product of Freedmen's, uh, the Freedmen's Bureau. They would then move it to uh, Arlington Cemetery to put the people into an open uh, environment. You can say it was one of the first planned communities. They had their own hospitals, their schools, but it was a community that was developed for only short-term use. You were supposed to come, get, and move out to other things. But the uh, people stayed. The village started to prosper. And then it, it, it really started in 1863 was when it first started. And it was dismantled in about 1890. Uh, around the turn of the century. But what it was that uh, land was perceived as valuable, still was not a friendly company, country to live in, was prior to the reconstruction area where blacks could not own land and things of that nature. So they dismantled the whole, whole place and uh, that started people migrating to uh, other parts of the county, but it was a self-contained community, uh, for planned community. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Any other questions? Yes. What about newspapers, or how did you get your news? Uh, uh, newspapers? newspapers? They had the Times Herald, they had the Daily News, they had the community newspapers, the Black ones, the Green Valley News, Busy Bees, Afro-American, Pittsburgh Carrier, and a lot, a lot, some from the black press and the black perspective and the Times Herald Washington, Washington D.C. had three newspapers. Times Herald was a morning paper, evening, uh, daily news was a catch-all in the middle, and you had the evening star. I'd say in Green Valley, what most people wanted for a newspaper was the Green Valley News, yeah. which uh, John Robinson published starting in the 60s. And most people would get that Green Valley News to see who died, who was born, who got married, who got all of the up. community news of what was going on in the churches. He had different reporters. And then it got to the point where John published that newsletter up until the year he died and he used a typewriter to type it on because yes. he didn't have a computer all those years. But I actually um, inherited the original Green Valley News that he had typed since 1963 where he had issues and you could go back and figure out who, had, who got divorced, who had babies, <laughs> who died, whatever happened in the neighborhood and it was also his form for encouraging people to get out and vote. Mm -hmm. He uh, chastised parents. If you weren't doing your parenting duty, you could find out who had a room to rent. You could find out whatever you needed of what was going on in the African-American communities. And he would walk that newsletter out, and he had news from Halls Hill, Johnson Hill, and Green Valley. That was one of my second jobs, because John started that newsletter with us earning money. If you come down on Saturday mornings, and help us collate and staple the newsletter, and then take it out in the neighborhood and sell it. If you sell it for 10 cent, you get to keep five cent and you bring five to me. And many of us growing up in the community went down there on Saturday mornings and helped put that paper together. Um, John also developed a group of teenagers that then started helping to collect the news and report it. So he, he, he was, that was the news for the neighborhood. The and it just got to the point in the end where a lot of the elderly people, they liked getting it, you know, sort of like reading the Washington Post. And I asked my mom one time, well, why do you read the obituaries? Well, they read it to make sure they're not in it. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, thing about John Robinson, we could have another whole session on John, Indeed. just here. But the, the Green Valley community, just a a couple of few weeks ago, uh, purchased a memorial plat for John's grave. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the ceremony. And now John has a plaque on his grave site at the uh, Pleasant Valley 
spot. Mm -hmm. And we will be, we have named our town square after John Robinson where his office used to be located. Awesome. So it will be the John Robinson Jr. Town Square. Awesome. Or it is the John Robinson <laughs> Town Square. All right, do we have any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so uh, if we can get the microphone in the second row, I saw the young lady at the far end first. Right Perfect. Right. And this is going to be our last question, I apologize. All right, hello. Yeah. Um, I think it was Ms. Portia Clark. Will you enlighten me? I didn't understand the reason um, for elementary school, you'd have to go to three or four different elementary schools? When, when um, the 1971 desegregation plan was started, the, they came up with this idea that in order to get the Drew broken up, we would um, send kids to Nottingham, Jamestown, and Tuckahoe. And it first started out that if you lived on one side of the street, like even you went to the north side schools, and if you lived on the other side, you went to another North Arlington school. And then over the years, there were several changes that were made to that plan. So the next iteration said, okay, we got so many issues with all of the kids being bused and not being able to go to Drew as a neighborhood school unless you were accepted to the Montessori program. Um, even though Drew had a traditional program, most of our families didn't know there were two programs in one building. And if you didn't go and apply to Montessori when you had a three-year-old, you were highly unlikely to get in at kindergarten. So the other iteration was by the time when they decided, okay, parents complain because kids were on the bus too long going to North Arlington. So they decided they would change the rule and you could go to a South Arlington school until third grade. And then for fourth grade, you had to go to a North Arlington school. And in my daughter's case, she was uh, not accepted into the Drew Montessori. So she was put in Claremont as our South Arlington neighborhood school. And then the next year they closed Claremont. So then she had to go to Barcroft as the next South Arlington school. So when she got to Barcroft and reached third grade, she was scheduled to then go to Nottingham. And that's the reason why a lot of our kids ended up going to different elementary schools before third grade. The point was that although the kids lived right around Drew at that time, they could not go to Drew because Drew was a uh, choice or countywide. You had to apply for so kids could live next door to Drew, but yet they were bussed out and going to the other one. Reverse bus, reverse integration. All right, well thank you. We are going to uh, formally wrap up. We did ask each of our panelists to reserve the time until nine o'clock tonight, so hopefully there will be an opportunity for you to mingle and maybe uh, question them if you didn't get an opportunity to formally ask your question in front of everyone. You know, I'll just say uh, briefly uh, as we close out this segment of the evening, as you think about Arlington's history, clearly we all can understand that segregation exacted a, a huge cost, uh, a material cost, a psychological cost, opportunity cost, but it's not that simple because at the same time there were some rich traditions that were in place um, and there was a tremendous sense of community that each of our panelists described experiencing that produced a lot of great creativity and resilience as is evidenced by the people that we have in front of us today. But it's also true that when we got to the period of desegregation, it didn't undo all of the issues that we had experienced during our segregation, segregated past. It brought with it a new set of issues and challenges and concerns. But through it all, hopefully you're getting a sense of the incredible resilience that these individuals had, but that they also passed on to their children and loved ones. And I would just like to say on behalf of all of the organizers of tonight, thank you so very much for giving us a sense of that wonderful history, but your unique role in it. So please join me in thanking our panelists.